Unlimited Podcast. Welcome to Automated. I'm your host, Mark Verbenkov, and in this weekly podcast, we will be exploring the impact of emerging technology on jobs, society, as well as us, with business and technology leaders, researchers, and independent professionals across the world. Okay, so to start off, uh, I was actually a little bit hesitant to publish this episode. So I actually think it teeters on the verge of controversial subject matter, and I really wanted to avoid this and stick to, I think, is a much more interesting point, specifically when it comes to the pandemic, surveillance, uh, government overreach, et cetera, which will be kind of the main focus of today's episode. So I really hope that I've been able to walk this little tight line as I want to avoid any sensationalist rhetoric, which I typically find distracting when listening to other people. So to start off, uh, earlier in 2020, I was actually quite amazed, as I think many of you were as well, by a number of the technologies that were being used to support the fight against the pandemic, even when we were still learning about how the virus worked and didn't even have a number of the protocols that we do now. So in a number of previous podcasts, I talked about many of the different technologies out there, like the autonomous robots using UV light to disinfect empty hospital rooms. AI systems analyzing lung scans to tell whether somebody had COVID or not before PCR tests and other testing practices were widely available. And of course, locally 3D printed valves for ventilators during the supply chain disruption issues. So I think that these uh, and many more technologies supported healthcare and of course, other essential workers in one of the most chaotic periods society has faced for decades and were praised for many of their contributions to alleviate the workload and stress of employees across the world. So there was also a little bit of overreach in certain instances in the early days of the pandemic. However, I think that most of these really occurred in China. So I touched on a few of these also in earlier episodes. Uh, For instance, drones were used to check if people were wearing masks outdoors and would give warnings to people through a microphone. The drones were also used to break up gatherings of people in public spaces. Uh, Chinese policemen were also outfitted with helmets that had smart visors on them that could detect body temperatures in crowds. And the hope here was that they would be able to identify infected people. Uh, Surveillance cameras were also installed directly in front of some homes in a bid to have people obey the quarantine rules. So in certain cases, alarms were installed on doors and at at least one case, a camera was actually installed inside of an apartment. And finally, there was, of course, facial recognition technology being used by police departments that could identify people even when they were wearing masks. So I think that though having a surveillance camera pointed at your door is, of course, incredibly invasive, wide-scale facial recognition use, in my opinion, constitutes the greater threat to personal privacy, not to mention the racial issues, false results, and other things that are really quite common with uh, this technology. However, there was some positive news over the past year or so from the West. Most notably, this was that Facebook actually banned the use and development of all facial recognition technology, which is, of course, a massive step, especially as social media platforms had been identified as one of the potentially larger users of this tech. Uh, Furthermore, in the United States, many states and cities had actually banned the use of facial recognition technology, and there was a push for a federal ban that has been underway for about a year or so now. So this was uh, also similarly the case in the EU, which had discussed having a five-year moratorium on all facial recognition technology in public spaces. And this included a ban on police using the technology in public spaces, as well as using it for predictive policing, which uses the power of AI to kind of profile people who will potentially carry out a crime. However, the initially proposed facial recognition ban in the EU has recently been reversed, and it is now up to each member country to do their own assessments and adopt the technology or not. And this really gets to the heart of the issue that I want to bring up in this episode today. As a consequence of the friendly, though intense Christmas discussions that I mentioned in the previous episode, one very large concern was brought up. And namely, this was that during the pandemic, 
there really appears to have been a disproportionate increase in the amount of surveillance and security technologies adopted by nations across the world, predominantly by governments, but also by the private corporations that typically use emerging technology. So I'll post a few of the reports and articles in the show notes that overall seem to indicate that though a number of technologies like facial recognition or general AI surveillance were already on the rise prior to COVID, the trend certainly increased substantially once the pandemic was underway, and even by certain accounts has made the surveillance increases after 9-11 seem mild compared to what we've seen over the past two years. And though the justification for this increase is of course going to usually be to deal with or fight the pandemic, I think that we really need to be constantly asking the question if the price is actually worth it, especially when there are large-scale actions taken that are unknown to the people it will impact. And on this point, most notably, and really the main initiator for this episode even being generated, were the concerns that were raised by some of my family members from the country that I come from, Canada. So at the end of December, just in time for Christmas, Canada's federal government admitted to secretly tracking 33 million phones during the lockdowns. As Canada's entire population is about 38 million, this was really not a small minority of citizens that were tracked by their government without their consent or knowledge. So the Public Health Agency of Canada bought location and movement data from Canadian telegiant TELUS with the justification to understand possible links between the movement of populations within Canada and the spread of COVID-19. So personally, as somebody who was actually in favor of voluntary track and trace programs early in the pandemic, and even critical of, for instance, where I currently live, Spain's lack of one, I don't think that a covert action like this can be justified even during a pandemic, especially when the organization apparently plans to continue the tracking for the next five years. What is perhaps even more concerning is that the Public Health Agency of Canada's private management division conducted an assessment and determined that since no personal information is being acquired, there were no concerns under the Privacy Act. So, of course, on one hand, it was great that the data was anonymized, but on another, it was only an internal division of the governmental agency that assessed the private concerns. And it, was, it became quite clear that once this news became public, independent critics were very quick to point out the possibilities for re-identifying data that has been previously de-identified. So just as a small point here before I continue with the episode itself, um, because this uh, episode was potentially a little bit more controversial, uh, I do have um, links to all of the articles that I was using in preparation for actually speaking on this subject. So uh, I do try to mention this as much as possible. But if you are interested in looking into either some of the things that I said, or the topic, just as an interesting topic, I do have all of the links up on the show notes uh, when the episode actually airs. So that was the clear example that came out of Canada. But in another example, Israel had actually been using live phone tracking, targeting confirmed Omicron infected people in late 2021. Luckily, this was stopped after only a few days and may have supported actually the initial slowdown of Omicron infection. However, in the press release, it was mentioned that the use of cell phone tracking in the future will be reassessed in accordance with morbidity. So I can fully appreciate the justification to use a tool that might actually have worked, that might infringe on liberties and privacy for a short time, especially during a crisis period. I'm not trying to avoid this aspect at all. My main concern, and the one that was brought up in the discussions uh, where I was made aware of it, is specific comments like the one above, and specifically the actions that follow, can gradually lead a population to become accustomed to these acts as a normal state of affairs. If governmental overreaches become common practice or as a new state of normal during a pandemic, it makes them much more likely to be continued once a pandemic ends or any kind of crisis period ends and specifically easier for a public to accept uh, similar surveillance and security measures that were, for example, enacted after 9-11 through the rhetoric of fighting terrorism that remain with us today. 
So I think a good example of this is what is happening in New York right now, where the mayor wants to fully embrace surveillance and security technology, modern technology, for the police as part of a $11 billion budget for the New York Police Department. So this includes uh, infrared cameras in public buildings, new weapon scanners to replace metal detectors in schools, uh, all the way to a general expansion of facial recognition technology across the city. So though gun violence and not the pandemic is the justification that is given, and we did see an initial pushback against the expansion, uh, there has not been a significant outcry as most probably would have happened in the years past, in my opinion, especially given the clear examples where in particular facial recognition tech has led to false arrests, misidentifications, racial issues, and even police manipulation. Uh, if you're interested in those things, I'll again have show notes to specific articles there if you, can, uh, if you want to read about them further. So essentially... It appears that as we have used new and expanded forms of surveillance technologies for the better part of two years to fight aspects of this pandemic, we may have grown accustomed to the idea that more of this type of technology is a desirable and even a normal part of society, which I think should be troubling for everybody. And as everyone has really grown tired with the pandemic circumstances we have continuously found ourselves in, I think that also many of us would even gladly accept some of these new technologies if they were proposed to end the problems and bring some safety and normalcy back to our lives, which I think is really the age-old argument of safety versus sovereignty. Now, I've purposefully ignored the vaccine passports due to the loaded ideas that come with them, though it has, of course, been argued as being one, if not the main technology that fits in this trend, but I'm not going to go there. So I hope that that was clear and that the kind of overall argument as I proposed it made some sense. Um, but if it wasn't before, I think that the final part of this episode is potentially going to be more controversial, and I will fully admit it is a leap and borders on, I guess you could say, the unusual or the unconventional but I really think it is interesting to think about. And at the very least, I'd like to end each episode discussing more of kind of the future ramifications of the technologies and trends that are discussed in the podcast. So might as well go a little bit further into the future. So why might this overall concerning idea of surveillance and the increasing amount of surveillance and the uh, different types of emerging technology that are used for surveillance be concerning for our future? Uh, why would it be more concerning for our future than it would be for today? So as anybody who has paid attention to this podcast or really any news or reports about technology, I think that we are all quite aware that the exponential growth of, technolo of technological capabilities will continue as the years go by, giving us, our companies and our governments more and more powerful tools to act with. And one of my favorite speakers on this specific idea in the last few years has been Dr. Yuval Noah Harari. He's, I think, most well known as the author of Sapiens, which I highly recommend if you haven't read it yet, as well as the two books that followed, uh, Homo Deus and 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. So um, I wanted to actually start off with a two minute clip where I think he beautifully merges the idea of the power of exponential technology and kind of one of the more nefarious problems of increased surveillance. This danger can be stated in the form of a simple equation, which I think might be the defining equation of life in the 21st century. B times C times D equals R which means biological knowledge multiplied by computing power multiplied by data equals the ability to hack humans. Ah, if you know enough biology and you have enough computing power and data, you can hack my body and my brain and my life and you can understand me better than I understand myself. You can know my personality type, my political views, my sexual preferences, my mental weaknesses, my deepest fears and hopes. You know more about me than I know about myself. 
And you can do that not just to me, but to everyone. A system that understands us better than we understand ourselves can predict our feelings and decisions, can manipulate our feelings and decisions, and can ultimately make decisions for us. Now, in the past, many tyrants and governments wanted to do it, but nobody understood biology well enough, and nobody had enough computing power and data to hack millions of people. Neither the Gestapo nor the KGB could do it. But soon, at least some corporations and governments will be able to systematically hack all the people. We humans should get used to the idea that we are no longer mysterious souls. We are now hackable animals. So if you thought that was at all interesting uh, and you actually want to hear his entire 30-minute presentation, uh, which he gave at the 2020 Davos meeting, I'll of course have the link in the show notes. Um, but connected to this, Dr. Harari has been, I think, one of the most vocal about the dangers of under-the-skin surveillance, which he actually wrote about in a kind of viral uh, Financial Times article at the very onset of the pandemic in 2020. So this is essentially retrieving biometric information about how your body is functioning through monitoring technology introduced or implanted into your body in some way. And it is, I think, at this moment that I think the teetering on the edge of the conspiracy theories is most notable. So I'll briefly address this here. So the, I really think that the most infamous conspiracy theory during this entire pandemic has, of course, been the microchips secretly put into the vaccine. So I think it's pretty easy to see that it is a rather ridiculous idea, and it's explained by the fact that we already have miniature supercomputers uh, that we carry around with us every day. Um, so I would assume that everybody knows that they track various aspects of our day-to-day -day life already. So there's really no need for a microchip, which negates uh, really the argument in its tracks. However, you know, the under-the-skin surveillance technology as posited by Dr. Harari seems to perhaps push back against this explanation. But I think the much more valid concern is connected to the idea of a potential new normalcy that I discussed beforehand, right? A cultural normalcy. So the microchip and the vaccine notion is one that needs nefarious and clandestine explanation to be plausible amongst many other things. But I think that the main worry going forward um, should be a cultural acceptance of technologies that monitor our biological functions and the collection of that associated data by any external entity. Not, you know, whatever the idea is out there, you know, Bill Gates putting uh, microchips and vaccines. That's, that's not a main concern. It, it's really the the cultural changes, the cultural norms that are changing that would allow something like that to happen in a much more uh, organic way. And it should be a real worry because if you look at our own life uh, and really the lives of those in your social network, I'm sure you'll see that not very much thought goes into the data that you allow to be collected about your online activities currently. Right? It has become really the absolute norm to scroll through the user agreements, click accept, and use whatever tool or app that is needed at that very second as quickly as possible. So on that note, I really think that the more pernicious idea here is if we allow a future to exist where we act the same as we do today when it comes to much more private data than our mere location or search history. And I hope at the very least some of these ideas uh, have been interesting to you, uh, though hopefully not as controversial uh, as I maybe made it out in my own mind to be. Um, so yeah, this uh, this podcast has not necessarily been that focused on the future of work or automation, but uh, as these themes were so highly pertinent to my holiday break, I think it really um, I really think that it was justified to bring them up, as I'm sure several of you also had at least some sort of discussion like this uh, during the break as well. But um, yeah, next week I'll be uh, bringing back the focus to automation and the future of work. Well, that's it for this week's episode. Thanks for listening. 
If you like what you hear and you want to support the podcast and the conversations here, the best way to do this is to go on to Apple Podcasts and leave a review as it helps the algorithm to reach out to new listeners and brings the show to them. Also, feel free to check out the website, automatedpodcast.org, where you can find the show notes for each episode, written articles on the themes of the podcast, and a library of resources on the topic of emerging tech and automation. Also, if you want to reach out and leave any feedback or you have any questions about the podcast or any of the conversations, there are general contact links such as email, LinkedIn, Twitter, etc. for you there on the website. And finally, for those of you that want more than just an audio conversation, the video recordings are now going to be up on YouTube for the newer conversations. So feel free to check out the videos by searching for Automated Podcast on YouTube, where, of course, you can like and subscribe if you prefer to support the podcast that way. The Automated Podcast.